Welcome back. Do you still remember the three therapeutic goals in addressing oral hematoma? The first one is to remove the hematoma contents. The second one is to oppose the detached cartilage and skin and that apposition must be maintained, correct? And the last one is to prevent recurrence by, how do we prevent recurrence? By treating the underlying condition that causes the excessive ear scratching. Well, so far, the previous methods only satisfied one or two goals. The surgical opening of the pina and the suturing of the skin to the cartilage hopes to attain all three goals. Let's begin. In ear fenestrations, an incision on the con concave surface of the ear is made to evacuate the hematoma and to oppose the detached cartilage and the skin together for just enough time for fibrous tissue to form. The dead space between the cartilage and the skin must be removed, and that is aided by the sutures. The anesthetic risk for patients of an oral hematoma correction is quite low, given that the problem is only localized on the ear, and there are no pre-existing cardiovascular and or respiratory compromise. Patient position is on its lateral recumbency with the affected eye up. Affected ear, rather, up. Gosh. Moving on. Knowledge of the surgical anatomy is very important for ear surgeries. Yep, I said it, anatomy. It walks hand in hand with surgery. Branches of the great auricular artery and veins supply the pina. Again, we discussed this before. The great auricular artery is a branch of the stylomastoid artery, and the main vessels are located on the convex surface of the pina but its smaller branches supplying the cartilage are on the concave surface. The facial nerve supplies the motor function of the ear. So when you see an ear of a dog twitching or the ear of a cat moving to side to side, that is governed by the facial nerve. While the sensory function is coming from the second cervical nerve, for the convex surface and the auriculotemporal branches of the trigeminal nerve or CN5 for the concave surface. The surgical approach or site of incision is on the concave surface of the affected ear. The affected ear is clipped and aseptically prepped. The ear canal, if not yet blocked, is cleaned and sealed with gauze sponges. A corner draping is done to only expose the affected ear. And using a scalpel blade, you can incise on the concave surface of the ear longitudinally or with a stab incision. Expect the hematoma contents to pour out. So prepare yourself with gauze sponges and any other um, sponges that you may have. Lap pads would do as well. For large hematomas, this process is very satisfying, as you can see in this image right here. So you have a choice of making a short incision or a long incision. Entirely your choice. If you choose a short incision first, you can extend this with a scalpel blade or with mayo scissors. Remove all hematoma contents, you, including fibrin clots and fibrous connective tissue inside. At times when the fibrous tissue are firmly attached to the cartilage, scraping of the cartilage and inner surface of the spina is done to be able to remove them. To see this process, let's watch this video. He chose to do a longitudinal incision and watch it all pop out. So satisfying, I'm sorry. So cool. Okay. Make sure to remove the blood and the clots, the fibrin, as you can see there. Wow. 
wiping the inside of the cavity helps as well to dislodge those fibrous connective tissue connected or attached on the cartilage. All right, make sure that no um, fibrin or blood or fibrous connective tissue is left inside. These would help this. What will happen if you leave those behind? What do you think will happen? Your goal after you remove the hematoma is to oppose the skin and the cartilage. You cannot do that if there's something in between. So you need to remove all of those things that got spilled over by the blood vessels and the damaged cartilage. For closure, let me make this clear because I see this more often than I would want or more often than I expect. You must not close the incision you just made. You need that for continual drainage. So what do we say when we are talking about closure? The role of the suture is to oppose the detached skin and the cartilage, to bridge the gap, to eliminate the dead space. The sutures must be placed vertically, as you can see in here, in a parallel direction to the blood vessels. A horizontal suture placement would inadvertently ligate the blood vessels and will cause necrosis on the pina. If you remember the anatomy that we discussed earlier, the direction of the blood vessels are this way, this way, and that way. So remember to place your sutures um, with a vertical direction. Sutures that can be used are monofilament absorbable sutures or even non-absorbable sutures such as nylon or polypropylene. You can also use for absorbable sutures your polyglactic acid. At a size of 2O or 3O, it all depends on the size of the ear that you are um, opposing. One centimeter long sutures are placed through the skin of the concave surface of the pina and the auricular cartilage. Make sure to include a cartilage in this suture. And have to make sure that all areas where there is a space must be sutured closed. These suture bites may incorporate the skin on the convex side. You may or you may not. To make sure that maximal compression, yes, those are buttons. I'm telling you right now, yes, those are buttons. The right side, those are IV lines. Remember what they are? Yes, those are your stents. Yep. To make sure that maximal compression is placed on the skin and the cartilage, stents, stents, stents such as IV lines and buttons may be placed as you place your suture bites. This will also help distribute the tension and prevent the curling of the pina as it heals because the fibrous connective tissue will tend to contract around it and pull the skin inward. So this stents would prevent that from happening. Bandaging the ear helps prevent pets from damaging the surgical site, either by shaking their heads or trying to scratch the site. It is important to avoid incorporating the normal ear in the bandage, and it is best or recommended to leave the hematoma site and ear canal opening exposed. Do not cover your sutures and the whole ear in doing the bandaging. This provides the owner and veterinarian access to the incision for monitoring and daily cleaning. It also allows the ear canal to be medicated if necessary. How do we start? Get your surgical tape. Uh, prepare two short strips of tape around six inch long. Then prepare another two long strips of tape three times as long as the previous one. You place these two short strips of tape on the medial and lateral margins of the convex surface of the pina. So you can imagine this part right here is the adhesive side of the tape. The tape, the two strips of tape must intersect on its end. 
depending on the patient's head size, less or more tape may be needed. Now, for the long strips of tape, you now place that on the medial and lateral margins of the concave side. So, on the same side where you operated, the pina will appear sandwiched between the two tapes, creating a secure environment. That's what we want. All right. Now, with a long tape here, wrap it around the head and neck until they end just ventral to the ear canal, which is this part here. Trim any excess tape on this side so it does not cover the ear canal. So you're basically stretching or reflecting the ear laterally, very much laterally, like it's covering, sorry, there's a mosquito, there, <laughs> as if it's covering the head already. So that is your goal. After that, if it's secure, you have to check. Place a soft padding or a gauze roll loosely around the animal's head, and this must secure the tape strands to keep the ear in a secured place. When we say it must cover the tape strands, basically that's that's it. I should not be able to see any of the tape that you have placed initially. Post-op concerns. The bandage should be checked periodically as the patient awakens from anesthesia to ensure that it is not too tight or restricting airflow through the larynx or the trachea. If it is possible to insert at least two fingers under the bandage comfortably, it is likely not too tight. The owner should also check the bandage at home at least twice daily to ensure it remains loose and it is not too soiled. And truck owners to return to the hospital to have the bandage changed when it gets soiled at least every three days. Bandaging should continue until granulation tissue is present at the surgical sites. Drainage is minimal and the patient is no longer shaking his head. Educate the owner about how to keep the incision clean and free of clots and debris. Show owners how to apply sterile saline to a gauze sponge and how to clean the surgical site. Let them know they should clean the site daily or more often if needed. An e-collar or Elizabethan collar is essential to prevent the patient from damaging the surgical site or the bandage. Sutures can be removed as early as 14 days post-op or can be left in place for 21 days to ensure adequate tissue apposition. Post-operative antibiotic therapy and analgesia are always indicated or recommended for an animal post-operatively. As usual, I am ending this chapter with a video assignment easily found in YouTube. And for those who have the USB, I also downloaded this and you can see it in the video assignment folder. Do not forget to let me know of any questions or clarifications you might have so I can address them as soon as possible. Again, this is the last coverage of the first lecture exam. Good luck and do not F it up. No, just kidding. Good luck, and I'll see you in the next chapter. Bye, guys.